Hi, my name is Exley and I'm from Christ Heritage Church. And while we uh, recognize the providence of God in spreading His gospel message through online videos, uh, this video may be used by God to edify you and to encourage you. But we believe that it is important for a Christian to attend a, to a local church. We believe that it is important for a Christian to be a member of a local church where he can exercise the ministerial gifts given by God. We believe that it is important for a Christian to sit under the preaching of a local pastor. And so the preacher in this video cannot and should not replace the office of the pastor in your, in your local church. Uh, it is our prayer that this video may help you, but again, we strongly insist that you don't miss out in the ordinary means of grace being done in your local church. Thank you. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, you know, two years ago, uh, 2017, uh, exactly the same date as, date as today, December 1, one of the highest grossing film ever made, um, Titanic, was re-released in theaters. December 1, 2017. And that re-release, of course, uh, will not give us a different uh, ending. Uh, the Titanic still sank. Well, there is a historical aspect of that story, meaning how the ship sank and what it actually looked like. There is a um, fictional aspect as well. Rose, as we know, uh, was played by uh, Kate Winslet. Uh, she was given a diamond necklace that was called the Heart of the Ocean, and it was her possession. It was given to her by her suitor. And you know the story, the ship sank, and she hid it. And after many years, as the story progressed, she lied to the people and um, she, shed, she, she said that she didn't have the, the necklace. Well, we all know that she, she did. And at the end of the story, sorry for if, you're, if you haven't watched it yet. At the end of the story, she tossed the necklace on the ocean. Well, the movie does not explain why, why she did that. We can only assume that maybe she values the memory of Jack more than that necklace. That instead of selling it to the museums and maybe they can, the fa her family can benefit from it, she probably thought that the necklace has served its purpose of always being there to remind her of Leonardo DiCaprio. And <laughs> when she's about to die, she threw it. Uh, now that shows us how valuable that necklace really was. How she held it as her possession all through her life. We can say the same thing of Christ, who was given a possession in eternity past and continuously holds on, holds that possession in his sovereign hand until the end of time when he will finally be united with it. The passage this morning is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. I will be reading from the English Standard Version. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. 
In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. Now, we have been looking and unpacking these verses for four weeks, and we have learned that these verses show that salvation is not just us escaping hell. Salvation is not just us being atoned for our sins. Salvation in its wholeness as per this passage, salvation is... Salvation is Christ-centered. Salvation is Trinity-honoring, eternity-rooted, redemption-providing, adoption-experiencing, holiness-producing, assurance-effecting, and God-glorifying. This is the picture of the plan of redemption that God the Father, that God the Son, that God the Holy Spirit has all agreed upon in eternity past. The three persons in the Trinity has agreed. They have covenanted with one another to redeem a people and that people will be in eternity future, be united to Christ in glory. That is the basic summary of the entire story of the Bible from beginning to end. And the one event that acts as the foundation that holds both ends of eternity is the one for all act that Christ that has done in history and that is his life and death. The purpose of choosing in eternity past is for Christ to redeem them on the cross in history. The basis of being united in glory in eternity future is what Christ did on the cross in history. This, as Christians, is a good reminder for us. We should always have that in mind, that everything we have, everything we are in Christ, both comes from God and will return to God. Lahat ng atin, ang ating katayuan kay Kristo ay mula sa Kanya at babalik din sa Kanya. It begins in His will and ends in His glory. It begins in His work on election, choosing people, and ends in being united to Him. And as Christians, we need to be reminded of that. Because at the end, it's all about Him. It's all for Him. It's all Him. It's all from Him. And today, to better understand this, we have... Ayan, bawal na ako na boses. We have verses 11 to 12. We can unpack this morning. And we will answer the how and why. How did he make us his people? First point, predestined possession. Itinalagang pag-aari. And why did he make us his people? That's my second point. Purpose of praise. Layuning pagpuri. So my first point, predestined possession. Paul says in verse 11, In Him we have obtained an inheritance. Now in other translations, it says heritage. It is heritage instead of inheritance. Now there are two popular views in this passage. One is that we really have obtained an inheritance. And what is that inheritance? Now, it may refer to us becoming children of God. And as children, of course, He gives us the right to expect an inheritance or that we gain eternity with the Lord. I mean, that in itself is our inheritance. If that is what it really says, I mean, that's fine. Nothing wrong. It's theologically correct. 
but its Greek translation suggests that the phrase talks about us in passive form, meaning it is not us who received inheritance, it is us who are the inheritance. It favors the notion that we are those who are made to be the inheritance rather than those who have obtained an inheritance. I mean, even in verse, verse 14, where it says the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. Again, in the passive form, which is translated in other versions as until the redemption of the purchased possession. Meaning, we, as the heritage of Christ, are awaiting for our final redemption, in this case, glorification. So again, in either way, it is fine to, to, to interpret it in either views because we indeed have an inheritance from God in Christ and that inheritance is indeed attained. Remember, Christ is the promised offspring of God who will bring spiritual blessings and we who are in Christ are co-heirs of Christ. So it's truly that what Christ obtains in salvation is what we also attain. We are in Him and so all promises made to Him are rightfully also fulfilled for us as well. So it is true that the believer was predestined to have a possession, an inheritance, and that is salvation. But it is also true. It is also true that the believer was predestined to be God's possession. But again, if the inheritance there refers to the believer's possession of, let's say, redemption, let's say, forgiveness of the trespasses, let's say, the sealing of the Holy Spirit, I mean, that would be a bit redundant in this passage. We would say that because of these benefits, that the believer is God's inheritance. That, that because of these benefits, that the believer is God's possession. And this takes it a step further. Not only do believers possess these blessings, but moreover, God possesses the believers because of all He has done for them. And He has done it not just for the sake of doing it, but by His good pleasure. And that is how we become God's heritage. It's because our destiny is as His inheritance was predetermined beforehand by Him according to his good pleasure. And Paul correlated our being in Christ with God's having blessed us in every spiritual blessing, having selected us for sanctification, for consecration, for blamelessness, having graced us and having redeemed us and forgiven us. And then now Paul correlates our being in Christ with our also uh, having been allotted to God which means that in His Son, Jesus Christ, God has acquired Christian believers as His own possession. He has acquired it. And this is a picture of God the Father in eternity granting to the Son the inheritance, the church, His bride. He has given Him the church as a reward for His faithfulness. When Christ died on the cross and rose again, He was installed as King. He was exalted as Lord. Yun yung sinasabi sa Philippians chapter 2. God exalted Him and He gave Him the name above every name and at the name of Christ every knee should bow. God the Father accepted the sacrifice that Christ has done on the cross and because of that God gave Christ the spoils of the victory at the cross and you and I are those spoils. Christ won us at Calvary. Christ won us for Himself. We are His inheritance. We are His heritage. We are the gift of the Father to the Son. 
That is what Malachi chapter 3, verse 17 says. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. And again, this inheritance, the possession, this possession of Christ is of course the church, tayo, the bride of Christ, the elect of the Father, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the body of believers, the universal church, the invisible church. This is not just the people of Israel anymore, just like in the old covenant. This is not just the Jews. These are the Jews and Gentiles who has come to faith in Christ. The Gentiles have grafted in. That was the mystery that was spoken of in verse 9 of Ephesians 1 and also in Ephesians 3. And so Paul addressed the entire believers in verse 11 when he said in verse 11, in him we, I mean this is a reference to the um, uh, to the entire, to, to all believers, basically. In fact, his use of we and the pronouns we and us from verse 4 to 11 pertains to all believers. But then we see, starting in verse 12, there becomes a sudden distinction. Verse 12. In verse 12, it says, Paul's use of the word we in the passage says, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ... Now, this is a reference to the Jewish Christians who were the first who hoped for the promised Messiah. The Jewish Christians who hoped for the promised blessings coming from the Davidic king. They were the first ones to hope, who looked forward to the coming Messiah. And then come verse 13 where it says, see, verse 12, it says, we who first to hope in Christ, and in verse 13 it says, in him you also, which clearly points to the Gentile Christians as represented by the majority of the people in Ephesus. That they also, when they heard the word of truth, the gospel of their salvation and believed in Christ were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So friends, the message of salvation is not just for the Jews. Even though, as Paul says in Romans 9, the Jews, the Israelites, uh, belong, they be, to them belong the adoption, to them belong the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship and the promises belong to them, the patriarchs belong to them, and from their race according to their flesh is the Christ. And Paul makes it clear that even though they had all of these, the blessing of salvation is freely offered as well to non-Jews, to the Gentiles. And the only thing that reconciles the Jews and Gentiles is that they are in Christ. Christ inherited not just the Jewish believers, but also the Gentile believers. Christ inherited the people of the new covenant, the church, Jews and Gentile believers who have heard the gospel, Jews and Gentiles who have responded to the gospel in faith and repentance, Jews and Gentiles who have received the promised sealing of the Holy Spirit. And this is the prized possession of Christ. We see in John chapter 17, verse 6, when Christ was praying to God the Father, He said, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now, John chapter 17 gives us a great picture of what this ownership really means. If you own something that you really value, I mean, you don't want to ever let go of it, right? It's the same picture. That's the same picture we can see in John chapter 17 when we see Jesus Christ praying to God the Father when, and when he also speaks about the disciples in verse 8 of John 17 is Christ has given them the word of God and they have received it and the disciples have come to know the truth. And then in verse 9, Christ is praying for them. Christ is interceding for them. Verse 10, Christ is glorified in them all that the Father has 
is Christ's. Verse 11, Christ prays to the Father to keep them, to preserve them. And then in verse 12, that he has guarded his disciples and not one of them will be lost. But of course, we know Judas Iscariot was unsaved. And then in verse 17, he says, and they will be sanctified by the truth. Now that is the picture of what kind of ownership this is. We are owned by Christ on the basis of the Father predestinating and giving the elect to the Son and on the account of what the Son has done on the cross and having that guarantee by the sealing of the Holy Spirit. And then Christ preserves us by interceding for us, by praying for us. That's what he said to Peter. I prayed for you that you're not going to fall. Now, if you struggle, if any one of you struggle with a sense of a lack of self-worth, just think about how important enough you are to God for God to take you, for God to purchase you, and to give you back to Christ as an inheritance. Now, friends, this is not a doctrine that is meant to boost our egos. This is not a doctrine that is meant to cultivate pride. But instead, this should cultivate humility. How can God put value in a body with filthy rags? How can God put value in a bride that is tainted with sin? How can God choose sinners and then give them to Christ? Friends, that is the way God's grace and love works he bought us on the cross now if you have not come to faith in christ if this is the first time that you've heard what who jesus christ is and what he has done well you have to put your faith in what he has done that what he did on the cross was in behalf of you that you're supposed to obey the law of God, that you're supposed to die of your sins, but Christ did it for you. So friends, put your faith in Christ and what He has done. Turn away from your sins and become Christ's. And just as how the Jews and the Gentile believers have been united in Christ, the veil has been torn so too we must seek us who profess uh, who, who are professing christians we must seek unity with the body of believers and that is a challenge for all of us i mean dapat nating hinahangad ang pagkakaisa ng bawat taong nananampalataya kay kristo porque hindi siya nandito pero professing christian siya we should seek unity but unity does not mean that all of our Christians, Christian friends may stay in one local church. Hindi ganun yun. Unity first and foremost is founded by the Word of God. That is what unites all of us. That is why we have a confession of faith and we are united as one in our beliefs. But we can also strive for unity with other Christians outside our local church in a sense that we must treat those professing Christians outside the local church as Christians that despite of differences that there should be love we must cultivate affection across these differences in one of Charles Spurgeon's sermons he talked about George Herbert now, George Herbert was a priest in the Church of England. He was a Christian. He, he, he lived two centuries before Spurgeon. And he held to this view, which is called high churchism. See, George Herbert hold to this high churchism view. What is high churchism? It is a view or a belief on having high regards, too much high regard on specific elements of worship. Probably higher than the actual preaching of the word. So George Herbert have that kind of view that he, 
highly regarded, specifically liturgy procedures, and they place high emphasis on ceremonies. It may seem as if they were actually like a Roman Catholic church, but really they weren't. Um, Christian churches who believed in salvation by faith alone may hold to the high churches in view. And that is what church George Herbert has adopted. And so in one of Charles Spurgeon's sermons, this is what he said. Where the Spirit of God is, there must be love. And if I have once known and recognized any man to be my brother in Christ Jesus, the love of Christ constraineth me no more to think of him as a stranger or foreigner, but a fellow citizen with the saints. Now I hate high churchism as my soul hates Satan. But I love George Herbert. Although George Herbert is a dis desperately high churchman, I hate his high churchism. But I love George Herbert from my very soul. And I have a warm corner in my heart for every man who is like him. Let me find a man who loves my Lord Jesus Christ as George Herbert did. And I do not ask myself whether I shall love him or not. There is no room for such questions. For I cannot help myself unless I can leave off loving Jesus Christ. I cannot cease loving those who love him. So are you a Calvinist? A Calvinist hating Arminian? Are you a continuationist who hates cessationists? Are you a covenantal who hates dispensationalists? We should not easily discount their profession of faith based on such theologies. We should not discount, easily discount their profession of being saved by faith alone in Christ alone. We should not easily unchurch a church on the basis of such differences. We are all one in Christ. That is what unites us. That is what unites the Jews and Gentiles in Christ. We are all his possession. We are all his inheritance. We are all his heritage. We are his. And the reason why we are his possession is in my last point. The purpose of praise. Paul tells us that there is a goal for being Christ's heritage. And that is to the praise of his glory. God wants to be glorified through his inheritance. And the reason for that glory and praise as per Paul is because he has showered us with every spiritual blessing. It is Christ, it is not us who acquired these blessings, it is Christ who acquired all of these. That we have been chosen in Christ and it's given to him as a gift. Though we are sanctified to be conformed in His image, we have been adopted to God as sons through Christ, that we have redeemed by Christ on the cross, that we have been forgiven on the account of Christ's righteousness, and we have been sealed by the Spirit of Christ. And these are happening because this is part of the plan of God that He has made in eternity past. And verse 11 says that this is according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. According to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. This means that God did not just plan these spiritual blessings. That this means that God did not just plan the redemptive work of Christ. That this means that even the means to accomplish the plan was his work. And the working of all things is something that is necessary because his salvific plan cannot be frustrated. And we see here the sovereignty of God over his creation. Now this is what we call the providence of God. It means God working all things, all of his creation, may it be human beings, may it be non-living things, to accomplish his purpose. This is how God deals with his creation, by providence. Now let me use the illustration that my, teacher of my, uh, that, my, that my teacher is always using when he explains providence. 
Let's say all of us here today are here in Ibiza Lounge in Circulo Verde. And it just so happens that um, me and my family, we live in Eastwood. And then today we, we met. Now there are reasons why we, Van and I, live in Eastwood. And one of those reasons uh, was... Well, we, we came from Antipolo and we transferred to, to Eastwood because we were hoping that we were a, we'll be able to serve in a nearby local church. And a lot of things happen by God's providence. He has worked all things together for me to be here, for my family and I to be here. Now, for some of you who live in Eastwood as well, may have, you may have different reasons why you live there. But then today, all of us meet here. It just so happens that this building is here in Circulo Verde, available for all of us. That no other groups are reserving this place, this perfect place and setting. I mean, we have this place, we're able to meet and worship God. That is God's providence. Working all things together. I mean, may swimming pool doon. Ready na rin tayo sa baptism. Pagdating ng covenanting natin. Providence. But God deals specifically with His inheritance, with His possession, I mean, differently. He deals with His church. He deals with us by His special providence. I mean, you might be here in this place that was providentially prepared for us by God, and you were invited by a friend to come here. I mean, ayaw mo pa nga sa umpisa, you were supposed to go probably to an outing today with your friends, but then you canceled it because may, you don't have enough money. And you don't have enough money because you were mugged the day before. And today, your friend invited you to come to worship, and then you heard the gospel. And then you got saved. Now, if you are... Christ's, if you are his possession, that is God working all things to get you here and not to get you to the outing, which also means that God has allowed for you to get robbed so that you can get here and eventually hear about Christ and what he has done on the cross. And then you respond to God by trusting Christ as your Lord and Savior. And because of the salvation that Christ has freely given you, you're also blessed with every spiritual blessing that comes with being united to Christ. Now that is His special providence. And this is the same thing of what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. It is God who is working all things together. This is not faith, F-A-T-E, faith. This is not the universe operating in of itself. I mean, so in any act of human sin, there's the intention to the glorification of God and to what is good in God's behalf. And then man is judged for the evil intention of his heart. I mean, there are teachings uh, that says that God, I mean, is surprised uh, in current, uh, with the current events, that he reacts to things. We should reject such teachings. It's called open theism. We should reject such unorthodox teachings. It says that in God's dealings, I mean, God's deal with his people on, on, on current events, his decisions are based on what is happening. It's like God uh, gets the newspaper and looks at the front page, ano kayang problema ngayon? Ah, okay, so ito gagawin ko. That is not God. He's not like that. God in eternity past has already planned everything. When Psalm 135 verse 6 says, Whatever the Lord pleases, He does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. And the psalmist wasn't saying that, he, that God just do what He pleases without even knowing what's going to happen. God decrees whatsoever comes to pass. And that therefore, everything that happens in the universe has a purpose. And this means that when Paul says all things in Ephesians chapter 1, 
that it may include if, even our sufferings. It, it, it may even include our tribulations. It doesn't say all good things. It says all things. We, we see that picture as well in the life of Joseph. Um, we see in Genesis, in the book of Genesis, his brothers plotted to kill him. He was sold into slavery. He was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife of attempted rape. He was put in prison, and we know his story. He was made a ruler in Egypt. But actually, he was very instrumental to the migration of Israel to Egypt. Where Israel, as we know, would be in bondage with Egypt for, in Egypt for 400 years. And in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, as Joseph said, after all of these things happened in his life, he said, As for you, talking to his brothers, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. But then after 400 years, God raised up Moses to be the leader of Israel. God then covenants with the people of Israel to preserve their line because ultimately the Messiah will come from them. And so the goal of mankind to praise and glorify God is founded upon that coming Messiah. And his purpose also, as he has given to Abraham, that he will bless the nations referring also to Gentiles, is being accomplished now. It is being accomplished now. Non-Jews are hearing about the gospel and they are responding to the gospel. He works all things together to accomplish his plan. God worked everything together from the time of Abraham, from the time of Adam to Christ. Now God is working together all things as well for his promised possession to receive his promised spiritual blessings and for the ultimate purpose of his glory. Now friends, this is the sovereign mighty hand of God working all things together for the accomplishment of his purpose. And as a result of this, praises should be ascribed to God for he deserves it. He is the only one worthy of praise. We are not believers for our own glory. And the moment we seek to be somebody, the moment we seek to or start to push ourselves up with, um, up the, up, up, up with God, in line with God, the same uh, pareho ng antas sa Diyos, inangat natin ang ating mga sarili, the moment we enter competition with the eternal God, and you know what? we lose. The glory and praises belong to God himself and not us. Now you might say that you are here because of everything that you've done, that whatever that is, or that you have this because of what you have accomplished. Now you have to remember the providence of God. We have to remember the providence of God. We have to remember the work of God in our lives. We have to remember the provision of God that in giving us strength by allowing us to be able to rest, allowing us to be able to eat, in giving us comfort by having people around us who cares and loves us, in sustaining us physically and also spiritually by giving us his means of grace through the local church that we can hear His word to strengthen our faith. And most importantly, we have to remember that the once and for all act of Christ that made everything else possible in the first place. We have to remember His life that because of the purposely fulfilling of the law, you and I are not under the law anymore in the sense that we are required to obey it to be saved. We have to remember His death that because of purposely atoning for our sins and becoming our substitute, He has showered us with righteousness, His spiritual blessings, His hope for eternal communion with Him. And we have to remember His resurrection as well, His ascension, His exaltation. For we are living not just for ourselves, but for the King who rules a kingdom that is everlasting. For we are His servants, slaves of Christ the King. 
So the next time we think of being superior than others, think again. The next time you think you deserve everything, remember Christ. Now have you been robbing God of His glory? Have you been living a life only thinking about your own and not thinking about the glory of God? Are your decisions in life all pointing to the glory of God? Do you live a life of gratitude? Or do you complain every minute of every day? Well, this is a challenge for all of us. That we should worship God by our words and with our deeds and in by so doing we cause others to see the glory of Christ. God's heritage, the church, is called to glorify God. And when God is glorified, people outside will see that. And when, when the church causes the outside world to also praise God by upholding the truth and faithfully proclaiming the gospel to them, God is also glorified in that. A while ago I said, a while ago I said that there was a fictional aspect in the movie Titanic, but there's also a historical aspect. There is a man, there was a man who was, uh, whose name was John Harper. And he was a real passenger of the real Titanic. So on the night when Titanic struck an iceberg and the sea poured in, one man was clinging to a piece of wood and he saw John Harper. And John Harper was actually struggling in the water. Mas safe pa yung naka, nakahawak doon sa wood. And then Harper shouted at that person. He asked the person, ang tanong John Harper sa kanya, are you saved? That's John Harper's question. And when the, uh, the man answered and sabi ng lalaki, no. Harper and then quoted Acts chapter 16 verse 31 believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved the man did not respond and they lost sight of each other nadala siya ng current but then bumalik the current brought them together again and Harper asked the same question Harper then slipped nung tinatanong niya yung second question nadulas na at nawala na siya sa paningin Nung lalaki. Now the man eventually, of course, he remembers John Harper all of his life, and he eventually did put his faith in Jesus Christ, and was later rescued by a lifeboat. Now, hindi hindi natin sinasabi na probably doon na siya na save or probably later in his life, but that event really affected his life, that it caused him to come to faith in Christ. And the man was asked a question about John Harper, and he said, I am John Harper's last convert. I am John Harper's last convert, ang sabi nung lalaki. You know, after the sinking of the ship, as news came in about the passengers, names were placed in one of two lists. Merong dalawang listahan, known to be saved and known to be lost. John Harper's name was under known to be lost. That in a way describes that event. He was known to everyone as someone who was lost. I mean, they couldn't find him. In fact, he was also not that known. I mean, probably ngayon lang natin narinig itong story in John Harper. This isn't a famous story. What made the multi-billion dollar film was the story of Jack and Rose, which are probably not true in the first place. He may be under the known to be lost list, but we know he is under the saved list. In the presence of God. And he faced death heroically and without fear because he never lost sight of his passionate purpose in life. And that purpose is to glorify God. To win souls for Christ. God is glorified, not dependent and not contingent upon everything that you're gonna do. God is glorified because of the gospel. And the gospel will cause you to do things that will be glorifying to God. <clears throat> Let us then glorify God by living a gospel-driven life. Let us remind ourselves of the gospel every day. 
Let us remind ourselves that God predestined us to be His children to the praise of His glorious grace. Let us remind ourselves that God made us His heritage and appointed us to live for the praise of His glory. And let us remind ourselves that one day He will finally return and consummate everything and everyone who are His for the sole purpose of His glory. And with this, we as His possession, as His inheritance, as Christ's heritage, the church should praise Him. Us should praise Him with our words and praise Him with all of our lives. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for the reminder that you chose us, you, re you have adopted us, you have redeemed us, you are sanctifying us. But Lord, you have reminded us today that we are experiencing such blessings because we are yours. We are your possession, oh Lord. May we live lives as re good representatives of our owner. Oh, Lord, thank you for your love and for your grace. Thank you for your mercy, Lord. We pray, oh, Lord, that, that this church and all of the churches who proclaim, who faithfully proclaim the truth of the gospel, Lord, I pray that they all will uphold the truth that it is Christ, the whole Christ, who holds together, who connects what the Father has done from eternity and what they will do as a triune God in eternity future. All because of Christ and what He has done on the cross. So, Lord, we thank You for this time that You've given us. Be with us today in Jesus' name. Amen.